Hello, thank you for joining us. So I'm here today with Jacob and Jed, and our plan today is to wrap up the Protagoras. So let's take a look at where we left off. So just some quick review from last week. So the last topic that we had hit on was this idea of measurement and the art of measurement. And Socrates said, like a practice where we want to put pleasant things and painful in the scale, and with them the nearness and the remoteness to tell which counts for more. And this idea of nearness and remoteness was important because, of course, many people will go for the, the immediate pleasure, even though they know there's going to be regret down the road. And so he, so there's a comparison then that he made between the art of measurement on the one hand and the power of appearance on the other. So the appearance of that immediate pleasure makes it seem like it's something better because you always will choose the better over the worse. And but it may seem like it's better, but then later you realize you are wrong. So he says, is it not the latter, that power of appearance that leads us astray? as we saw in many a time, causes us to take things topsy-turvy and, and to have to change our minds, both in our conduct and in our choice of great or small. Whereas that art of measurement, this would have made the appearance ineffective and by showing us the truth, would have brought our soul into the repose of abiding by the truth. And so it would have saved our life or at least saved us some embarrassment or some money or some pain. And so he then goes on to say that this art of measurement is a kind of knowledge, a knowledge of measurement. And the idea that nobody does wrong willingly is tied into this idea that when we make mistakes, it is, they, it is from the defect of knowledge that people make mistakes, that people err when they do err in their choice of pleasures and pains. And so the erring act committed without knowledge is done through ignorance, right? So the opposite of knowledge is ignorance. And so that was pretty much where we left off. Uh, any comments about that before we go on? We're good? Okay. So I'll just reread this last paragraph because that'll set us up for um, the section ahead. So this is at the bottom of page 243. And for those of you on, on YouTube who have a different text, this is 350, sorry, 358A. Okay. Such would have been our answer to the world at large. And I ask you, Hippias and Prodigus, as well as Protagoras, for I would have to make a joint, I would have you make a joint reply, whether you think what I say is true or false. Well, they all thought what I had said was absolutely true. Then you agree, I continued, that the pleasant is good and the painful bad. And let me entreat my friend Prodigus to, sh to spare me his distinction of terms. For whether you say pleasant or delightful or enjoyable, my excellent prodigus, or in whatever style or manner you may be pleased to name these things, pray reply to the sense of my question. At this prodigus laughed and consented, as did the rest. Well now, my friends, what of this? All actions aimed at living painlessly and pleasantly are honorable, are they not? And the honorable work is both good and useful. And they all agreed. Then, if the pleasant is good, no one who has knowledge or thought of other actions as better than those he is doing, and as possible will do as he proposes if he is free to do the better ones. And this yielding to oneself is nothing but ignorance. And mastery of oneself is as certainly wisdom. So, of course, the yielding to oneself is replacing the idea of um, being overcome by pleasure. 
what it really is is yielding to oneself and it's doing it in an ignorant way so he calls that ignorant and so master of oneself when you don't um become overcome by pleasure that is a kind of wisdom so they all agreed with that and then he goes on well then by ignorance do you mean having a false opinion and being deceived about matters of importance and they all agreed to this one also then surely no one willingly goes after evil or what he thinks to be evil i just want to point out again that evil does not have the same connotation to the Greeks that it has to, to us in our modern you know, Christian um, society or Christian influence society. It's not, um, it doesn't mean that you have like this inherent sin in your soul. It just means something bad. Okay. So no one willingly goes after evil or what he thinks to be evil. It is not in human nature, apparently, to do so, to wish to go after what one thinks to be evil in preference to the good. And when compelled to choose one of two evils, nobody will choose the greater when he made the lesser. And all this also met with assent of everyone. Well, is there something you call dread or fear? So notice now he's bringing in some new terms, dread or fear. And is it, I address myself to you, Prodigus, the same as I have in mind, something I describe as an expectation of evil, whether you call it fear or dread? Protagoras and Hippias agreed to this description of dread or fear, but Prodigus thought this was dread and not fear. Well, no matter, Prodigus, but my point is this. If our former statements are true, Will any man wish to go after what he dreads when he may pursue what he does not? Surely this is impossible after what we have admitted, that he regards as evil that which he dreads, and what is regarded as evil is neither pursued nor accepted willingly, we saw, by anyone. Here also they were all in agreement. So much then being granted, Prodigus and Hippias, let our friend Protagoras vindicate the correctness of the answer he made at first. Not that which he made at the very beginning, when he said that while there were five parts of virtue, none of them was like any other, but each had its particular function. I do not refer to that, but the statement he made afterwards, when he proceeded to say that four of them had a considerable resemblance to each other, but one was quite different from the rest. Courage. And he told me I should perceive this by the following token. You will find, Socrates, he had said, that men may be most unholy, most unjust, most dissolute, and most ignorant, yet most courageous. Whence you may judge that courage is very different from the other parts of virtue. His answer caused me great surprise at the moment, and still more when I went into the matter with your help. But anyhow, I asked him whether by the brave he meant bold. Yes, he had replied, and impetuous. Protagoras, I, Protagoras do you remember making this answer? He admitted that he did. Um, after here, he's, Protagoras is going to have a speaking part. So, Jacob, would you mind reading Protagoras? Sure. Okay, thank you. Well, now tell us, towards what do you mean they are impetuous when they are courageous? Towards the same things as cowards? No. Then towards other things? Yes. Do cowards go after things that allow boldness and the courageous after dreadful things? So people say, Socrates. Quite true. But my point is rather towards what, according to you, are the brave impetuous? Dreadful things in the belief that they are dreadful or towards what is not dreadful? No, the former has just been shown by the arguments you put forward to be impossible. 
that might have been a little confusing. Do they go towards dreadful things knowing them to be dreadful? Or do they go towards them with the belief that they're not dreadful? And he shows that the former one, that they know it's dreadful, but they still go forward to it, can't be possible. It's by ignorance that people do what is harmful to them. Um, quite true again, so that if this proof was correct, no one goes to meet what he regards as dreadful, since to be overcome by oneself was found to be ignorance. I admit this. And yet all men go also to meet what they can face boldly, whether cowardly or brave. And in this respect, cowardly and brave go to meet the same things. But still, Socrates, what cowards go to meet is the very opposite of what the courageous go to meet. For instance, the latter are willing to go to war, but the former are not. Is going to war an honorable thing or a base thing? Base here meaning the opposite of honorable. Honorable. Then if it is honorable, we have admitted by our former argument that it is also good, for we agree that all honorable actions were good. True, and I abide by that decision. You are right to do so. But which sort of men do you say are not willing to go to war, that being an honorable and good thing to do? The cowardly. Then if this is honorable and good, then by our argument at least, it is also pleasant. That certainly has been admitted. Now do the cowards wittingly refuse to go to what is more honorable, better, and pleasanter? Well, if we admit that too, we shall undo our previous admissions. But what of the courageous man? Does he not go to the more honorable and better and pleasanter? I am forced to admit that. Now, in general, courageous men do not feel base fears when they fear, nor is there anything base in their boldness. True. And if not base, then it must be honorable? Yes. And if honorable, then good? Yes. And the cowardly and the bold and the mad, on the contrary, feel base fears and base boldness? I agree. Do they feel base and evil boldness solely through stupidity and ignorance? Just so. Well now, the cause of cowards being cowardly, do you call this cowardice or courage? Cowardice, I call it. And were they not found to be cowards through ignorance of what is dreadful? Certainly. And so they are cowards because of that ignorance? I agree. And the cause of their being cowards is admitted by you to be cowardice? I agree. Then ignorance of what is dreadful and not dreadful will be cowardice? Yes. But surely courage is the opposite of cowardice. Yes. Then the wisdom that knows what is and what is not dreadful is opposed to the ignorance of these things? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. And to this, he could still nod assent. Then Socrates goes on. And the ignorance of them is cowardice? And to this he nodded very reluctantly. So the wisdom that knows what is and what is not dreadful is courage, being opposed to the ignorance of these things. And here he could no longer bring himself to not agreement, and he remained silent. Um, before I go on, I just want to point out that there we have some definitions. So I want to just read to the end, because we're very close to the end of the dialogue. So we can read to the end, and then we can come back and take a look at these definitions. Okay. But we have a definition there of cowardice and a definition of courage. 
And then Socrates proceeded. Why is it, Protagoras, that you neither affirm nor deny what I ask you? Finish it by yourself. I must first ask you just one more question. Do you still think, as at the beginning, that there are any people who are most ignorant and yet most courageous? I see, Socrates. You have set your heart on making me your answerer. So, to oblige you, I will say that by what we have admitted, I consider it impossible. My only motive in asking all these questions has been a desire to examine the various relations of virtue and its own special nature. For I know that, were it once made plain, that other question on which you and I have argued at such length on either side, you maintaining and I denying that virtue can be taught, it would be, it would be cleared up satisfactorily. Our discussion in its present result seems to me as though it accused and mocked us like some human person. If it were given a voice, if the argument were given a voice, it would say, What strange creatures you are, Socrates and Protagoras! You, on the one hand, after having said at first that virtue cannot be taught, are now hot in opposition to yourself endeavoring to prove that all things are knowledge, justice, temperance, and courage, which is the best way to make virtue appear teachable. For if virtue were anything else than knowledge, as Protagoras tried to make out, obviously it would not be teachable. But if, as a matter of fact, it turns out to be entirely knowledge, as you were, Socrates, I shall be surprised if it were not teachable. Protagoras, on the other hand, though at first he claimed that it was teachable, now seems as eager for the opposite, declaring that it has been found to be almost anything but knowledge, which would make it quite unteachable. Now I, Protagoras, Observing the extraordinary tangle into which we have managed to get the whole matter, am most anxious to have it thoroughly cleared up. And I should like to work our way through it, until at last we reach what virtue is, and then go back and to consider whether it is teachable or not. Excuse me. Um... Lest perchance your Epimetheus beguile and trip us up in our investigation, as he overlooked us in your account of his distribution, right, a reference back to the myth that Protagoras had told earlier in the dialogue. And then Socrates says, I like the Prometheus of your fable better than the Epimetheus, for he is of use, use to me, and I take Promethean thoughts continually for my own life, when I am occupied with all these questions. So, with your consent, as I have said at the beginning, I should be delighted to have your aid in the inquiry. I approve your zeal, Socrates, and the way you develop your arguments, for I think I am not ill-natured, and I am the last person on earth to be envious. Indeed, I have told many people how I regard you, as the man I admire far above any that I meet, and as quite an exception to men of your age. And I say I should not be surprised if you won high repute for wisdom. We shall pursue the subject on some other occasion, at your pleasure. For the present, It is time to turn to another affair. I quite agree, if you think so. For I was long ago due to be where I told you I was going. I stayed merely to oblige our excellent Kellyus. And here our colloquy or conversation ended, and each went his way. And this is the end of the dialogue. So we have quite a bit to look at here. Uh, First... 
I want to go back to those definitions of um, courage and cowardice. I can highlight this. Okay, so there's cowardice. Ignorance of what is dreadful and not dreadful. And so the wisdom that knows what is and what is not dreadful is courage. This highlighter is weird. It's just doing two line, full lines. All right, we'll just leave it like that. Okay, so what do you think of these definitions? Jacob, what are your thoughts? They're good definitions. I thought uh, courage was, uh, you know, knowing whether to fear something or not. Mm. So pretty much exactly what I had picked up probably I think from your channel. Hmm. Yeah, this is very similar to I th I do have a video um on my channel of the four virtues and I was pulling quotes from the republic and this is very similar to what we saw in the republic. I think it's quite different though from the way most people think of courage. Cuz people who do what we consider brave acts will tell you that they're still afraid. But they do it anyway because they believe it to be right. So this is quite different from, I think, the common notion of courage. What are you thinking, Jed? I've been hung up on the beginning of this <clears throat> um, speech where he said seeking what is not painful and what is pleasurable is honorable and they agreed that trying to do what doesn't bring pain and what brings pleasure is honorable i didn't like that i didn't see that and then they went on to every time they say what is honorable we can also say it's good and we can also say it's mm -hmm. pleasurable. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that. Um, okay. And maybe I missed it earlier in the dialogue. An example of something that is honorable but not pleasant? Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. Standing up to a bully can be unpleasant. Um, uh, what's oral is also okay, honorable. We'll take that one. Why would you do it? If it's um, not Why because, is it honorable? Because it's um, true. It's it's you're speaking to the truth and perhaps acting in a way that will help the development of the person that they are bullying. Well, that would be yourself, right? <laughs> if they're bullying you, yeah. But if they're bullying bullied. somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you would also send. Yeah. Okay. Also standing up to a, a bully if you see a, you're a third person, right? Okay. Okay. Is that something good? Yes. To do? And according to their argument, whatever's good is pleasant. According to their argument. Yes. But I, it wouldn't be pleasant to mm -hmm. do. Well, it may not feel good, but at the moment. But it's the desirable thing to do, right? It's pleasant in that sense. It's a, it's a very broad use of the word pleasant. It's not fun, maybe, but you see it as the right course of action. It's the right, even though mm -hmm. it can be very painful mm -hmm. or you might get punched in the nose. Um, mm -hmm. And even the confrontation with somebody can be unpleasant. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in that weighing of the the pain is near, but the good of it is more remote, but it outweighs the the painful, right? And yeah. what they were saying is that what you ultimately will call which label you put, pleasure or pain, depends on that weighing. What is the outcome? 
And if you think that pleasure of correcting the bully, either defending the person being bullied or possibly even helping the bully to change, if that outweighs the pain of getting punched in the nose, then the label you put on it, even though it includes both pleasure and pain, would be pleasure, according to this argument. And in this scenario, I don't see myself mm -hmm. getting any pleasure, especially if I'm just helping somebody else who's weaker. Like, they might get pleasure of being able mm -hmm. to keep their hot dog that the bully is trying to take, and they get the pleasure mm -hmm. of eating it, but I don't get mm -hmm. any pleasure from it. I'm just doing it because I think it's the right thing to do. Well, if you don't see any pleasure in it, then I don't think you would do it. If you I do would. it, if I... you if you think it's the right thing to do, and that outweighs the pain of getting punched in the nose, or potentially getting punched in the nose, then you must be see that good that you feel that it's right, that sense of this is the right thing to do, that's your pleasure. So, so <laughs> I feel like we're using pleasure really loosely. Yes. And I, I almost wonder, you know, because I, I, don't, I don't buy the conflation. I know that's the argument for Protagoras, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he, is, he is a sophist. So mm -hmm. maybe Socrates is having to do some sophistry himself to get along with him. Because I think in other dialogues, maybe even Socrates makes the counterpoint that the good cannot be conflated with the pleasurable. Mm. So, yeah, in the dialogue yeah. by Libas, they show that knowledge outweighs pleasure. It's more important than pleasure. So, I think, yeah, this argument is maybe geared towards people who put a very high standard on pleasure. And I think maybe that's why they had um, geared it towards the many. They worded it in that way. This is what the many say. The many go for whatever they think is most pleasurable, but sometimes they make mistakes, but nobody errs willingly. It's because they make, they're make poor at that art of measurement. Right. I, I think that's an opinion still very mm. common today. Yeah, so I think that for people who are maybe a little more philosophical, maybe we do have to use the word pleasure loosely because it may not necessarily be fun. But there's a certain satisfaction you get from doing the right thing or a certain sense. Or also, at a certain point in our development, I think we reach a point where we know we should have done X, Y, or Z. It would have been the honorable thing. And if we did not do that, we're going to feel a certain kind of pain. Right. That's the only way I can... Um, mm -hmm level the the scales of this measurement is yeah. by saying well yeah. it's not pleasurable in a fun sense but i do it because it's truth and it's the right thing to do and i have a belief that or maybe even an understanding that if you follow the logos if you follow what is right and true uh even though you don't get pleasure from it it will one day lead to wisdom and mm -hmm. wisdom is a kind of pleasure. It might be transcendent and beyond pleasure, but loosely speaking, you could say it's a kind of pleasure. That's the greatest of all pleasures. And, and that yeah. promise that you may or may not even reach is mm -hmm. part of that measuring of the scales. The promise mm -hmm. of the greatest pleasure that if you follow the logos, even when everybody else is throwing stones at you for being a philosopher, then it will be mm -hmm. worth it in the end. Yeah, and that also fits into the measurement argument that you have to think of the nearness and remoteness, and that could give the appearance of something very remote, may have the appearance of being less significant. And part of the philosophical journey is that as we go along, we get a better, um, we, we put a higher value on that wisdom that we're seeking. And even though it may seem remote, we, and hopefully we're getting closer, it doesn't seem as remote as we go along. Hopefully it doesn't feel remote anymore, but even if it does, we 
we put a high value on it. Mm. Yeah. And so we're willing to go through, sorry, the practices and the the difficulties and all the struggles. Yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? Well, like, yeah, these texts that we've been reading, um, mm -hmm. it's like Plato is uh, building a very beautiful and poetic and rational case for that thing we don't yet see we don't yet have that right. wisdom or knowledge but we're gaining his opinions that are beautiful and then the more we talk about it together mm -hmm. those opinions and beliefs can turn into understanding when we can right. understand how it fits together it's still far off though but yeah he's mm -hmm. making a um he's like you could say he's even a a sophist for the good in that sense um, mm -hmm. that he is making a case, a, a compelling argument, the mm -hmm. difference being it's for truth, whereas mm -hmm. Protagoras might be making a compelling argument for those to start their journey towards something that isn't towards truth, that is towards right. ignorance. Or towards social status or wealth or reputation, yeah. Yes, yes, and towards those things that in sense. relation yeah. to mm -hmm. the knowledge that Socrates and Plato are building towards we would call ignorance right. and yes. therefore training cowards, I suppose, according mm -hmm. to this definition. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they're not aiming for ignorance. They're, they think what they're doing is good, but they're erring unwillingly. Yes, just to be clear. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I really like the way that Plato organized these dialogues, the early dialogues all leave it open-ended like this, like trying to meet people where they are. He starts with, um, he's addressing readers who are coming with a lot of conventional notions of what is wisdom, what is courage, what is cowardice. And so meeting people where they are. And I think that's part of the reason why this argument is here about bringing in pleasure and equating it with good. Because that is a common notion. And then later, as Jacob pointed out, he is going to make that distinction more. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's how um, this makes sense. Because if you were to talk to people about a kind of good that transcends pleasure, that's not in their wheelhouse. They have no experience of that. Mm -hmm. You might as well be talking Greek. Um, so you've got to mm -hmm. sort of tr translate it into the language that they're familiar with. So if the greatest good that they're familiar with uh, is sort of pleasure related, you have to sort of um, lower the status or, or use analogy kind of by saying this knowledge that you're seeking, that if you pursue the logos and not people like Protagoras and not the things that Protagoras wants you to pursue, this, this good that we call knowledge or wisdom or the knowledge of the self it's like pleasure. It's like pleasure. It's like the greatest pleasure. Mm. So, yeah, you're. it's like meeting the person you're talking to where they're at with their language. Mm -hmm. Even though when you get further along, you might realize, well, it's the, the pursuit of the Logos happens in spite of pleasure and pain in mm. the Republic, for, for instance. Right. Yeah. And the other side yeah. of that is we talked about... Uh, if you didn't stand up to the bully, later mm -hmm. on you might be going through the pain of saying, I wish I would have, or I wish I would have said this, or I wish I could have been more courageous. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a kind of pain that you might have for weeks or years, which mm -hmm. if you do the calculus, if you can mm -hmm. remember what it was like to do that, mm -hmm. then the pain of potentially being punched in the nose uh, is lesser than the pain of feeling guilt and having that ref mm -hmm. that internal dialogue. Exactly. So that art of measurements still functions, even for like a Socrates or somebody on a philosophical path, working with Socrates, that kind of person, people like us. Yeah, but the danger with that is mm -hmm. the that reflection of what I should have done can be very heavily influenced by, I don't know, the pathologos or the, the false beliefs of the society or the zeitgeist. 
Like you, you could sure. believe, but well, I should. That's why it's a knowledge. That's why it's a knowledge. And sometimes right. we have false opinions about that measurement. Right. So we need both the knowledge about what we actually should have done. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people could be saying, oh, I wish I would have beat up the bully when actually the best course of actual action or, you know, if I had my, my gun on me, I should have shot him like an action hero. But actually mm -hmm. that could be ignorance fed yes. to us through your family mm -hmm. or through society. Right. So That's the appearance of the art of measurement. Of having right. Mm. Right. So this we need. We need a way of dismantling. The standard, through mm -hmm. which we do the art of measurement, that is false, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well as a way of gaining the true measurement. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to beat yourself up for not having shot the guy when it was bad to have shot the guy. Mm. Right. Sorry, Jacob. Were you about to say something? Maybe kind of getting into like stoicism here, but it's like when you're thinking back on an event, like in our bullying event, you're thinking back on it, like I should have done this or I should have done that. Mm -hmm. um, it's already in a, you're already in a precarious situation because you're kind of evaluating that situation from what you, you know, think you know about virtue. Mm -hmm. So if you if you don't have a good grasp of virtue, you know, you you'll be in that double ignorant state where you're, you know, basically assuming you know what you don't know. So that's why I think it it more even like going back and thinking about past events maybe can be you know setting yourself up for you know a bad time. Even even if you look back and you're like, I did a great job bullying, you know, by stopping that bully, then like, you know, you could still be wrong about that. That could be arrogance, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So either either way on it, I don't know. Yeah, but I, exactly right. Yeah, so we're back into the theatetus here, of the difference between opinion and knowledge, and whatever knowledge is, it's not this art that he's talking about. This art of measurement. It's not as simple as like having a checklist and going down the checklist. It's, it can't be idiot proofed because wisdom can't be idiot proofed. It wouldn't be worth much if any fool could be wise. It's a kind of wisdom. And so that brings us back to these definitions. The wisdom that knows what is and what is not dreadful is how he defines courage. So you need a kind of wisdom, which means we have to figure out and hold on to this question of what is this wisdom? What does he mean by this word wisdom? Because it's the way he's describing it, it's not like our common definition where you have an understanding of what is the right thing to do mm -hmm. and you're still scared, but you get will or, or spirit and you put that behind you and you and you do it anyway that mm -hmm. th this these ideas of spirit or will or energy are being stripped from our definition to the point where mm -hmm. he's saying you don't fear it anymore you're not working against the fear that you have to build the will of the spirit to work against he's equating it to wisdom it is the wisdom so if you know what's right you will just naturally automatically or 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 effortlessly do the courageous thing mm -hmm. so they're no different wisdom is courage mm -hmm. where's the difference why give them two different right. words exactly so in this nose is episteme same word that was used in the theatetus so what is this knowledge what does it mean to have this knowledge of what is and is not dreadful it can't it's more than just an opinion it's more than just something that you can explain to someone else. Right? It's a change. So, There's something in the soul. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, on that point where, where it's like 
something you have to explain to mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. I do. I feel like that's kind of a point in this dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, too. You know, something I heard recently was like the difference what is the difference between a philosopher and a, a sophist and it's it's not just that the sophist wants to get paid uh for for it it's that the sophist will try to put knowledge into the person mm -hmm. and a philosopher will you know bring the knowledge out out of mm -hmm. the the subject exactly. mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point, and that jumps me to, I was I have a bunch of questions here. I'm going to jump ahead a little, because that actually ties into the Mino. So a few months back, or a year ago maybe, we read the Mino. That dialogue also talked about whether or not virtue can be taught, and is it a kind of knowledge? But that dialogue tied in also the idea of the theory of recollection. And I'm going to actually, it's in this same text, so I'm just going to jump us ahead to look at that. So this is the Mino. It's in the same text for those of you using the same um, the, the same PDF. Um, it's screen 327 if you're following that. But if you want to check this on your own in a different text, it's 81C. Or if you have the lobe, the paper one, it's page 303. And this is where Socrates introduced Persephone, that, that whole myth of Persephone. And then he said, seeing then that the soul is immortal, and has been born many times, and has beheld all things, both in this world and in the nether realms. She, the soul, has acquired knowledge of all and everything, so that it is no wonder that she should be able to recollect all that she knew before about virtue and other things. For as all nature is akin, and the soul has learned all things, there is no reason why we should not, by remembering but one single thing, an act which men call learning, discover everything else, if we have courage and faint not in the search, since it would seem research and learning are holy recollection. And I'll stop there. So we had this question back then. What is the connection between this idea of recollection and this whole conversation about virtue? Did Socrates change the subject or are they connected? Well, now after going through Protagoras and seeing Socrates coming from another angle to look at the same question of whether or not virtue can be taught, now we can come back to this question. What is the connection? Or what do you see any connection between this theory of recollection and this question of what is virtue and can it be taught? So, yeah, my, yeah, my kind of, I was thinking on that, you know, uh, with like the Socratic method, you mm -hmm. have like types of, of people, right? Mm -hmm. And Protagoras is a sophistical type of person so to communicate well with protagoras he has mm -hmm. to stoop to that level of of sophistry and so when at the beginning protagoras has his view that you know virtue can be taught uh you know it's pointed out that at the end he has switched stances on it mm -hmm. and uh, Socrates essentially brought forward the correct uh, point out of him uh, with that. And also that Socrates had changed his view on it. But I don't think Socrates had actually changed his view. He was just presenting both sides of, of the argument. And, you know, I would say when we say like taught virtue, that it's it's 
it's not taught in the sense that you're just like mm -hmm. beating it right. into them. It's right. Like, it's like Protagoras had the right answer, but not the right way of teaching. He didn't wasn't using the word teaching correctly. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Jed, anything you wanted to add to that? So, so the question that I had was if the way that we're defining courage is different from how we normally think of it and even how Protagoras thinks of it, where um, you need a kind of spirit or energy, something to overcome your, um, your lack. Fear. Of, yeah, their fear. It's different from mm -hmm. that in that you just don't have the fear anymore the knowledge that you have about what is actually good and honorable and pleasurable, all three wrapped up, that knowledge means the fear goes away. You're not overcoming anything. Um, mm -hmm. In which case my question is, well then wisdom and courage are the same. It's not, yeah, it's like, uh, I suppose, um, the question that Socrates opened up with in his di dialectic or dialogue, what kind of a part is it? Is it like a mm -hmm. part of the face, like your ear is very different than your eye, or is it like gold where every part is th exactly the same? It sounds like that one. In which case, mm -hmm. why do we have two different words? And then we went into the Mino where um, we were talking about that knowledge being within us but he says um uh so long as i couldn't find the text the part in the text was it page 100 and 327 no, um it's if you're using the pdf then it's green 327 but if you're looking at the page numbers in the text it's 303 oh yeah it gets a little confusing um he said mm -hmm. If we pursue this with courage, mm -hmm. so he's saying, um, this knowledge that we're seeking is something we, in one sense, already know. We're bringing it out of ourselves. So long as we pursue this line with courage, so mm -hmm. there I see the distinction that I'm looking for between knowledge and courage. Knowledge is the goal. Courage. Courage has the addition of time. We have a time that we are not there yet. It's in the future. Mm -hmm. It's so maybe that's the difference, which is interesting mm -hmm. because in our calculus of um, making a, a good decision, an honorable decision, mm -hmm. um, the measurement that we're calling it is the weighing of pleasure and pain plus time. And it's the time frame that can make it hard to see. It's the seeing the pleasure up close is easy, but being able to see it far away is hard. And that's where appearance comes in because appearances, the closer it is, it's easier to see. So this mm -hmm. time seems to be the only different, the only difference right. because in the Mino, he's saying we have the knowledge it's within us. We can get there. So long as we pursue this um, path and for that, we need courage. Mm. The courage to do the thing that will be in line with knowledge when you don't have knowledge. Right. There's a certain trust. It's a so trust. You may start with that trust, but then it may build to an understanding of, oh, yes, this will lead me to wisdom. And then as you start to gain knowledge, then you can, your courage is much more resolute because you know that some of the things you had feared in the past are not truly fearful. Right. So at the end, like um, the sides of the pyramid of like mm -hmm. wisdom and knowledge and on the other side, we've got courage. Eventually they come up and when mm -hmm. they meet, um, you will do the activity that we call courage, um, the kind of activity, which mm -hmm. maybe that's another difference. The knowledge is not necessarily a functioning in the everyday world. It's a knowingness. 
Whereas the courage is something that you do and how you live your life. But eventually when they come together, when you have knowledge and you, then mm-hmm. you will, your courage will be the same. It, it, it won't mm-hmm. take, there is no added time in the calculus between mm-hmm. knowledge. Mm-hmm. So you've removing time from that calculus mm-hmm. removes it, its mm-hmm. difference. That's right. But yeah. for us at towards the bottom of that pyramid, um, mm-hmm. we do have the fear. So, mm-hmm because we only have opinions and beliefs from Socrates and Plato. And then the more we do this philosophy and reasoning together, the more we see it and gain our own understanding, but we might understand it, but we still might be afraid. Mm -hmm. So there's still, we are still working against fear. Mm -hmm. Eventually Socrates is saying, well, when we have true courage, which is no different than knowledge, we don't, and we don't even have the fear. Mm. we're there so we will right. be courageous but mm. that's kind of like obvious because you know it mm-hmm. and you know it when you see it and you understand it and with every fiber of your vision fiber mm. of your vision fiber of your being that it isn't different but for the rest of us there is a mm. difference and that difference is time and the process of moving from through those cognitive stages that we talked mm. about yeah nice yeah, so maybe Socrates would stand up to the bully and would see pleasure in it and would not fear getting punched in the nose. Right, and the non-philosopher mm-hmm. might um, create an argument why he shouldn't have stood up to the bully mm-hmm. and us mm-hmm. philosophers might have stood up to the bully even though we were afraid but realized, well, one day I won't be afraid. But for now, right. I am a mm-hmm. little bit, only because there's a time gap between my current stage of not having remembered knowledge yet and that one day when I will. Right. And the art of persuasion is you can make rhetorical arguments on either side and have a debate over should you stand up to the bully or not and you would have your arguments. But it's not based in this idea of knowledge the way Plato is using the word. And that brings us back to this, to the Mino and this idea of recollection. How does recollection connect then to this whole discussion of virtues? Do either of you see a connection? I think Jacob's earlier comments actually did touch on it. That's what inspired me to jump to this question, talking about what sophists do versus what philosophers do. Do you remember what you said there about putting knowledge in versus pulling it out? Right, just that philosophers Mm. will try to, you know, do that Mm. Socratic method thing and get get the what they actually believe out of them, Mm. versus trying to, uh, you know, make them have a certain opinion that that Mm. you already have. Mm. So, if Protagoras is wrong to want to put virtue into people, then what does that tell us about virtue? What does that imply about virtue? That we're all already virtuous. It kind of goes back to that whole myth that we talked mm. about mm. earlier. Yeah. Right. That virtue is something in the soul. It's something mm. that we can recollect. That this wisdom, this knowledge that we're looking for, we already have. And that brings us back to the uh, end of the text. Let's see where we were. Um, Somewhere around two steps. I want the Greek. This idea that you mentioned of Mm -hmm. we could argue either side. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm really hammers home a point we mentioned previously of philosophy isn't just reasoning. You also Mm. need to have from somewhere a brief experience or probably somebody who's already there. You have to have the end. You have to have someone like Socrates who's at the end so that when you're going through this reasoning of should I punch the bully, 
you're you're not you're reasoning towards something that will bring you that knowledge, bring you the recollection of that knowledge within your soul. Mm-hmm. So it's not just the knowledge, it's the ability to make that path through reasoning and arguments to that mm-hmm. goal. Mm-hmm. Which I guess we can put that the word for that reasoning and arguments rational leading us to the remembering of wisdom of knowledge we could call that logos we also have to have a mastery or or skill in the logos as well as have someone who's reached it like socrates letting us know hey you're on a journey to seattle i know where it is head in this direction Mm. it certainly helps to have that yes but yeah, Isn't what it? we're seeing is that this, that what we're moving towards or what our goal is, those of us seeking wisdom, it's a state of mind. It's a condition of the soul. It's not about learning certain things. Like you can't go to school and get a degree and now you're wise. You go to school, you get a degree, maybe you're educated, but you're not necessarily wise. They're different things. Maybe the the logos, the, mm. the, the like maybe this is a kind of education where we're learning not the knowledge itself, which is the remembering within the soul, but how to make good arguments that is likely to to reach there. Maybe that could be taught to some degree, but um, ultimately, though, it's not about following certain steps. These things may be helpful in the training of our soul. But it is still a state of mind. There is no... Um, there, there's no way around doing that. It's not like you can say, well, if I just study if these certain points of the Logos, and then I'm going to break the Logos down into these steps, and now I'm going to study these. That sounds like you're trying to find a cheat sheet. Until and I reach the knowledge. Studying the logos is helpful. And like the Parmenides dialogue, teaching the certain terms of the logos. But that in itself, it, it, it doesn't replace that transformation of the soul, that true growth of remembering the wisdom of the soul. And it is a whole change of one's state of mind which is the goal we're moving towards that we need courage to follow the logos to reach if we're not there yet ourselves yes so maybe that could be a learning and maybe that's that step those steps of rational reasoning um uh, matt your mic's on we can hear you sorry Um, okay thanks Maybe those steps of reasoning that we need to follow the logos until courage and knowledge become one. Mm-hmm. Maybe that we can learn in a, in a sense, and maybe that's what Socrates is teaching to the people there. Look at how I'm talking. Look at how I'm reasoning. Look at what I'm avoiding, the tangents. Look at how there's a um, humanness involved with like meeting Protagoras where he's at. This mm-hmm. is the following of the Logos that mm-hmm. you can actually teach mm-hmm. until you get the knowledge which is, which is within mm-hmm. you that you can't be taught because it's a remembering, mm-hmm. but these are the things you can teach and this is what I am teaching to all of the people there. Mm. These are the, the symbols or the tools that may help us pull that wisdom, that knowledge out of our recollect the knowledge that's in our soul. Right. So everybody there who, who is actually there to get to as students of Protagoras should give Socrates the money for that day because he's the one giving the lesson in what actually can mm-hmm. be taught, the following mm-hmm. of the logo through dialogue. Mm. Perhaps, yes. He, I don't think he was a wealthy man. Not too many people thought to pay him money. They just liked their conversations with him and never gave him any money. Yeah, so he wasn't the one 
collecting the money here, right? Right. And uh, one, oh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. You were going to say. Well, I was just going to say, um, seeing as Socrates is the one acting like a teacher, mm -hmm. their conclusion comes down to courage being um, that movement towards what is actually good and honorable and will bring pleasure tied to knowledge, which we have seen is through this dialogue. Um, Protagoras is the one pulling out. He's saying, well, I agree, you're very convincing, blah, 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 mm -hmm. but I've got other better things to do. Mm -hmm. Better things right. to do than this? <laughs> Could we then make a judgment about yeah. Protagoras' mm -hmm. state relative to mm -hmm. courage? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Yes, you can. Mm. Yeah, and also it was it was tough to get Protagoras to... Me like meaningfully have the conversation with Socrates. Socrates right. had to like threaten to leave uh -huh. to like get him get him in Good there, point. get him in the yes. game. So there were battles all throughout. Yes, right. A different sort of battle that we would normally think relates to courage, but it was a battle, and there mm -hmm. were skills. There was swords mm -hmm. and shields. There was flattery. Mm -hmm. Like at the end when he flatters, oh, you know what. You might feel like we're at odds at the end of the conversation, but actually I'm where you were at the beginning. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like if it turns out that courage is the same as knowledge, don't feel embarrassed about being wrong about that point, Protagoras. Feel proud that you actually uh, said that courage can be taught because if it's knowledge and if knowledge can be taught, then you're right and other people will agree. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a kind of dance that he's doing with the human emotions and feelings and pride <laughs> tied to courage often of the person who he's helping and relating to. So it's kind of a battle. It, it, like there was an engagement part of the battle, like there isn't any fight. How, like people who are interested in like martial arts and things, how do you go in? How do you how do you shoot? How do you make the uh, initial engagement and then mm -hmm. what do you do in there and then how do you disengage these are all parts of battle but we're seeing socrates go through that in the logos in the actual mm -hmm. thing that we're tying to courage mm -hmm. which is beautiful but also we're, we we are left with the question who then is the courageous person and do we have enough to go on in how Protagoras related at the very end to make that mm. judgment. Mm. Right. Yes. Good point. And I want to end on this one question here. Why did he mention, why would Socrates throw this in? What do you think of the sentence? I like the Prometheus of your fable better than the Epimetheus, for he is of use to me. And I take Promethean thought continually for my own life when I am occupied with all these questions. Um, it may be helpful to keep in mind, I think that the readers in Plato's day of this would know that the name Epimetheus literally means afterthoughts. He was the one who was the kind of the bumbling fool who acts first and thinks later. Whereas Prometheus literally means before thoughts. Think of like epilogue and prologue, epi and pro. And Metheus is thought or mind. So Prometheus thinks first. And in mythology, this character Prometheus was said to have premonitions. And whatever he said was going to happen truly was going. He, he would only speak truth. So when he told Zeus such and such is going to happen, Zeus knew it was true. Okay, so that's Epimetheus and Prometheus. Socrates threw in this very strange sentence here. I think it even ties back to the beginning, very the very beginning of the dialogue, mm. where I forgot his name, but someone wanted to learn from mm. Protagoras and Socrates. Right. Said, let's let's yeah. think about this. Hmm. Yeah, that guy is not much of a 
Prometheus, was he? <laughs> right. He was right. an He's Prometheus. Like, yeah, I'm let's ready to give him my money that. right now. I don't know what this guy teaches, and I don't know what wisdom is, but let's just. But I know I just want to study with him because he's really famous. Mm. Forgot that character's name. Oh, Hippocrates. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe we'll leave it there. Um, so that wraps up the Protagoras. And then I was thinking that for next week, continuing on with this idea, looking at different virtues, uh, maybe we can take a look at um, Charmides is um, a dialogue. It's in the same book as the Alcibiades. So for those of you who are with us for that, you already have the PDF. But I will put the link for the PDF in the description box. And Charmides is a really nice one to look at. Oh, we just lost Jacob's camera. Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, it's a really nice one to look at because, let me switch to the big screen here. It's a nice one to look at because this one focuses on temperance, sophrosune. And this is maybe the virtue that is the most confusing to most people of what exactly is temperance? We have a lot of misunderstandings. We imagine it to be like denying your emotions or um, just about willpower, denying yourself things that you want to do. Uh, you really want to eat that chocolate cake or you really want to get drunk or whatever, but you deny yourself that because you tell yourself that some healthier choice is better. And so you're not happy. So that's not really the full flowering of what temperance is. So the truly temperate person is quite different from that. And so Charmides really looks at that. And it's also in first person from Socrates' perspective. So again, we'll get to look into his thoughts and get some sense of the way he thinks. And that helps us see him as an example of temperance. So I think that's a good one to look at next. And so um, those of you watching on YouTube, hope you will join us for that. And if anybody watching is interested in joining us in these discussions, um, drop me an email. There is an email address in the description box. So if you drop me an email, I can give you the information and give you a link so that you can get on this platform with us. So. Thank you very much and hope you'll join us for the next dialogue. So, bye.